Hey guys, this is going to be a continuation of our Unit 1 notes. This is Lecture 2, and we're going to cover parts of Chapter 1. Chapter 1 covers the scientific method and experimentation. Remember we said that psychology is a science not because we study the brain and neurotransmitters and our senses and things like that, but it's because we use the scientific method to experiment and to collect data, which gives us results about whatever it is we might be studying. So one of the first things that a psychologist must do is be curious. We have to question the world that we live in. And in being curious, we can think of something that we would like to study. And in doing that, we can collect data using descriptive research, which is what today's lecture is going to be on. There are three ways in which we can collect this data, through a naturalistic observation, through a survey, or a case study. Descriptive research is completely different than experimentation. And we're going to get into the difference between a correlational study versus an experiment. And it is very important that you know the difference. So what is the first step to the scientific method, to research? It's being curious. If you look at any of these questions, these are all things that a psychologist or anyone can study through descriptive research or through experimentation. So for example, if we want to know if being involved in high school athletics improves test scores or improves academic performance. We can set up a way in which we can study that through the collection of data. Maybe we give out a survey. Maybe we look at grades of high school athletes versus non-athletes. Let's say that we want to study uh, whether or not the consumption of caffeine in the morning improves first period grades. We might have one group of individuals who we tell to drink a cup of coffee and then we look at their first period grades. And our other control group is going to be people who don't drink caffeine. And after we give them that experiment, after we tell them drink caffeine, don't drink caffeine, over a series of weeks or months or even years, we can look at their first period grades and see what the difference is. So that curiosity is very important to psychologists because it gives us a question that we can then go research through either descriptive research or through experimentation. Of course you have to have a hypothesis. This is seventh grade science. A hypothesis is a testable prediction that lets us accept, reject, or revise a theory. So for example, we have a hypothesis here. If families do not stress gender differences, then there will be fewer sex differences in siblings. So what this hypothesis is saying is that if you have a family with male and female children in it, but yet you don't give the male a football, you don't dress him in all blue, you don't tell the little girl that she's a princess and give her Barbies. If you don't do those things, then they are going to be more like one another than, than not. A theory, then, is an explanation that integrates principles, organizes, and predicts behaviors or uh, events in the future. So for example, a theory might be families influence the gendering of their children. We know this to be true. Even before children are born, when you know that it's a boy or a girl, you start to influence that child when their sex is known. So that's a theory. A theory is much more broad than a hypothesis. A hypothesis is much more specific. Now with any of our hypotheses, with any questions that we have in psychology, we need to operationally define what it is we are studying. This is a hard concept for students to grasp, but it is very important that you know it. An operational definition is an exact description of how to derive a value for a characteristic you are measuring. So what an operational definition includes is a precise definition of the characteristics and how specifically we are going to measure that characteristics. You're going to be doing some practice with operational definitions. So for example, if we go back to that question, does the cons caffeine consumption improve first period grades? We need to operationally define first period. Well, are you talking about first period at Northern High School? Because that starts at 730. Are you talking about first period at DSA? which starts much later. We also need to operationally define caffeine. What do we mean by caffeine? We probably want to know, are we giving them a cup of coffee? Are we giving them a Coke? Are we allowing them to drink tea or a monster energy drink? Because all of those are different definitions of caffeine. So for example, maybe giving an exact milligram of caffeine consumption would be an operational definition of that. 
We also need to operationally define grades. What do we mean by grades? Are we talking about test scores? Are we talking about how many of these students are turning in their homework? We have to operationally define what it is we are studying. The reason why we want to do this is so that after we collect our data and after we have our results, we want another researcher, another psychologist to come after us and to be able to recreate our study. Well, why would we want someone to recreate our study? We want someone to recreate our study and to get the exact same results that we got. Because if that happens, if another researcher comes along and uses our operational definition of first period caffeine consumption and first period grades and gets the same results that we got, that shows that our data is legitimate, that our data is good data and that our study worked. That it's not just some random fluke that happened out of chance alone. Operational definitions, again, are how you are defining the variables that you are studying, and it allows another researcher to come behind you and to recreate your study. Now let's get into descriptive research. One of the first ways you can research something through a descriptive research rather than an experiment is through a case study. A case study takes a small group of individuals and studies them throughout time. One of the psychologists that uh, was known for his case studies was Jean Piaget. He studied children and how they developed cognitively in their brains over time. The problem with case studies is that because the population that you're using is very small, you could run into some sample errors or biases in that. As a researcher, the larger your population, the better. Another way that we can use descriptive research besides a case study is handing out a survey. All of you have filled out a survey at some point in time. Surveys are really good because they're pretty easy. The problem with the survey though is that you have to be careful for wording effects. You have to be careful for how you word things in your questions in your survey. If you've ever taken a survey, let's say there were 25 questions, maybe 50 questions, and you started taking the survey and you realize once you get to question 10 or 11, you think to yourself, hey, didn't they already ask this? They probably did, but they're rewording the question that they are asking you to see if you respond in the same way. You're going to be taking a lot of surveys in psychology and you will run into this. So when you give out a survey, you want to make sure that you're not leading people in, to answer in a specific way through the way that you have worded things. So look at these two questions. Do you approve of government censorship of media, sex, and violence? Most people would probably say, yes, you do think the government should censor sex and violence that's on TV. You can also ask the same exact question. Do you approve of more restrictions on what is shown on television? Most people are going to say no. The question is asking the same thing in general terms. However, your responses to those two questions could be different. So with a survey, you really have to be careful for how things are worded. With a survey, you also need to focus on random sampling. You do not want to give your survey to just your friends. Why would you not want to do that? Well, your friends are probably very similar to one another. They have things in common. Therefore, if you only use your friends in your sample, in your survey, your data is going to be skewed. It is not going to be correct. So random sampling is really what is best. How can you random sample? Maybe you ask every fifth person that walks in the building. Maybe you stand on the street and you ask every 10th person that's gone by. That's a random sample. And your sample should come from a larger population. So if you're studying the effects of caffeine on first period grades and you're using students at Northern High School, that is the population of students that you are studying. How you sample them is up to you. And we always want the sample to be random. We never want to handpick people to answer our surveys because that's going to skew our data. The last type of descriptive research is a naturalistic observation. This is where you do not intervene as a researcher at all. You're not giving individuals anything. You're not asking them to fill out a survey. You aren't studying them over a period of time. All you're doing is watching them in their natural environment. 
This is often used with animal studies in psychology. So you want to figure out how chimpanzees interact with one another without necessarily using language. So you sit back as the researcher and you just observe. A naturalistic observation is where you do nothing as the researcher. All you're doing at or all you're doing completely is just observing what is going on.